everybody. How y'all doing? All right? It's been a while. Let me introduce myself again. You know, we had Pathfinder stuff going on, actually two of the last three weeks, then we had a guest speaker. And so we finished up, you know, the seven seal, or excuse me, the seven uh, churches before we, you know, did all, had all that going on for the last few weeks. And now we're, we're doing a transition into the, you know, the seven seals. So we're going to continue on that study. And I just want to pray, kind of get my mind in the right place, and ask God to really bless us as we as we study this pretty amazing passage of Scripture. We're going to actually cover up, as you can see, you know, normally it's like a smaller passage of Scripture, but this is really Revelation 4 and 5, two chapters. Now, obviously, I'm not going to go through, we'd be here all day if I were to hit all of that, but I want to just kind of get the main big picture theme that really sets up this, uh, you know, what's known as the seals, the seven seals of Revelation. So this will kind of set us on, on the track for it. So let's bow our heads for prayer. Thank you, Father, so much for giving us the scriptures that enlighten our, our minds and give us understanding. And as we look in the book of Revelation, the revelation of Jesus Christ, we see a, a, a bigger picture of him than really we see almost anywhere else in scripture. I pray that we would see the big picture and that we would see Jesus in this, Lord. Thank you. We know, we know that you're here with us and you will bless this study. And it's exciting, Father. Help us to focus our minds and realize that we have such an opportunity now in this moment if we will channel our energies in to study in your word and seeing you in this moment. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, I, you know, I like to do this. Like, kind of, it's been a while since we've been in the book of Revelation, a few weeks. So, you know, the, the, the Google Earth imagery that I give you, you know, you want to zoom out a little bit first to kind of get a context of what you're looking at and then start to zoom in so that way you kind of see the big picture. So let's just get a quick overview of the Revelation of Jesus Christ, which that is the title of the book. You know, we often just shorten it to Revelation but it's actually the revelation of Jesus Christ. And it's important to keep that in context. It's not the revelation of future events or scary beasts or the Antichrist. or that That's not what the book is about. And if we're studying the book of Revelation with that kind of view in mind, we're actually starting off on the wrong trajectory. Does that make sense? Just go in the wrong direction with it. The book of Revelation, the revelation of Jesus Christ, is to reveal Jesus Christ to us. And so as we study it, we want to see Him better. And of course, in contrast to counterfeits and things that obviously that, that Satan is doing to try to obscure Jesus for us. And so revelation, the book of Revelation helps us see Jesus. So here's the overview of it. <clears throat> Chapters and themes. Now this can really be broken down in a much smaller way, but let's just keep it big picture, okay? So the first three chapters, we have the seven churches. We just finished going over that. And then chapters four through seven, we have the seven seals. And then chapters eight through 11, you have the seven trumpets. And so you'll notice that there's a pattern here, okay? The, ch the seven churches, seven seals, seven trumpets, they're covering the same ground. It's, it's recycling the same, uh, you know, I should say recycling, it's not the right, right word, but, but let's back up and put it this way. If you've ever studied the book of Daniel, you see that like in Daniel chapter two, there, there's a there's a dream that the king has, and Daniel comes and interprets the dream, and it really lays like a like a very basic foundation. And then in Daniel chapter seven, Daniel has a dream, and it goes over the same ground that chapter two went over, but it fills in the gaps more. And then in Daniel eight and nine, you know, Daniel has a a, a vision, and, and that covers it a little bit more. And so you see this kind of then we get to chapter eleven, the same type of thing. And so what we see in the book of Revelation is the same pattern that God has used there in Daniel and other places in Scripture where he'll, he'll share something and then he'll come back around and he'll share it another way that gives you a different angle, but he's really kind of covering the same time periods. Does that make sense? And so, you know, the seven churches are really basically giving us an overview of God's church from the time of Christ. Or really, the time of the first century, the time of John, you know, maybe half a century after Christ. <clears throat> From that time period up until when the saints are sitting on the throne, okay, with, with, with the Lord. And, and you see in the seven seals, excuse me, the seven churches have to do with really the church's relationship to God. As we went over that, we saw 
How are the churches relating to Jesus? Okay? And then the seals really get into how is God uh, relating to his church? Okay? And I won't get into that a lot this week. Maybe next week we'll unpack that. There's a lot of covenant language in the seals. And then we get to the seven trumpets, and that is how is God relating to the wider world? And how is the wider world relating to him? Okay, so it's covering the same type of, the same ground, um, a historical framework from, from the apostles' time up until when the whole great controversy is finished into the millennium and sin is over and, and, and there's harmony and everything's fine now, you know, at the very end, okay? It's covering it this same time period from these different angles of the church's relationship to God, God's relationship to the church, and then God's relationship to the wider world that is actually hostile to him and hostile to his, his church, okay? And then when we get to chapter 12 and then 13, chapter 12 is kind of a hinge one. I won't get into that too much, but um, it, it kind of sets the framework for what is going to come next. And then you get to chapter 13, uh, and then chapter 17 uh, really gets into end times kind of stuff. That, that's, where the, that, that's where it really zooms in, and that's where the focus is. And that's evil's plan, what, what the devil's up to in the last days. And then Revelation 14 through 19 is God's plan, what he's up to in the last days. And then Revelation 20 through 22 is God's victory. So that's kind of the big picture overview of what's going on in the book of Revelation. And here's where we're going to jump into uh, this morning is the, is the seven seals. So this is uh, Revelation chapter 4 and verse 2. Remember, we go through the first three chapters and the focus is on earth. So it's these churches are on earth, so to you know, the church in Ephesus, write this. To the angel of the church in Smyrna, write this. And so it's all focused on what's going on on earth with these churches, but we see Jesus standing there in the midst of the lampstands, which represent the churches. So the message there is Jesus is with his churches in every age, okay? But the focus is here on earth and what's happening here. There's a shift that happens in Revelation 4, and you'll notice the focus moves from earth to heaven. He says, at once I was in the Spirit, and there before me was a throne in heaven and one sitting on it. So then the focus shifts uh, up to God, up to His throne room in heaven. And so Revelation chapter 4, if you read the whole chapter, it's just really this incredible introduction to God's throne room. We see what is happening in the very throne room of God. It's almost like the situation room in the White House. So if the president's got some serious stuff to deal with and he has his advisors together and they, and they go in the situation room, okay? So it's like you get this feel in Revelation 4. It's like God's situation room. You know, his throne is there. The angels are there. He's different, you know, entities are there. And and, and, and it's, this, it, it's, a, it's a pretty powerful chapter of what all's, you know, going on there. But then we get to chapter 5 and we see that there is a significant crisis that's at the very heart of God's government, okay? So I want you to open up your Bibles and let's just look at this. We're going to start out Revelation chapter 5. Won't cover the whole chapter. I um, encourage you to do so at home. By the way, I think you'll get a lot out of the, more out of this if, um, if you're actually reading Revelation at home. Okay, so if you're reading, like say this week, reading chapter 4, reading chapter 5, reading chapter 6, and spending some thoughtful time just familiarizing yourself with the content of, of, of these chapters we're studying, obviously you're going to get more out of it if you put, if you put some in there, because I'm not going to cover everything that's in there. I'm going to just kind of zoom in and hit the highlights, but it'll really, I think, you'll just get more out of it. You'll, you'll get a deeper blessing if you just take the time to do that. So I do encourage you to do it, okay? So we're going to start out Revelation chapter 5, verse 1. Um, we'll read, we're not going to read all of it, but we'll, we'll read up some of the, the first part of it, enough to get the context there. And as we go there, you get your Bibles out. I'm not going to have it on the screen. You want to be paying attention to it, okay? If you're using your phone, that's good. I use mine too. Don't start texting your friends and, you know, seeing what the weather is going to be like. That, that can wait. That can wait, all right? Um, just, just, just go right there to the text, Revelation chapter 5, and as we, we read this together, matter of fact, I need to be turning there, don't I, while I'm, I'm telling you what to do, because you know, y'all going to be ready, and I'm not, so let me get there too, Revelation chapter 5, as we're getting there, uh, excuse me, as we read it, there's, there's really two questions that I want you to keep in mind, I don't want you just to read it, and just with your mind not really engaged, so I want you to read it and ask yourself these questions. What is the problem? Remember I said here in chapter 5, we have this major crisis that is at the very center of God's government. 
All right? That's what Revelation chapter 5 describes for us. It's a big deal. What's happening is a huge deal. It's such a big deal that John, who's writing all of this, is weeping profusely. So he's crying like a baby. That's how bad it is, what's happening, okay? So I want you to ask yourself a question as we're reading. What's the problem? What's happening here? And then second is, uh, what's the solution? And then we'll unpack it some more. That's going to start out kind of big picture. What's the problem? Then what's the solution? And then we'll start unpacking it as we, as, as we move through the message, okay? Y'all ready? Yes? Yes? All right, good. Praise the Lord, because I'm ready. Let's do it. All right, Revelation, <clears throat> Revelation chapter 5. I'm starting here in verse 1. Then I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll. What did he see, everybody? A scroll. Where's the scroll at? Well, I'll get there. With writing on both sides and sealed with how many seals? All right, seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming in a loud voice, Who is worthy to break the seals and open the scroll? But no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth could open the scroll or even look inside of it. I wept and wept because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or to look inside. Then one of the elders said to me, do not weep. See the lion of the tribe of Judah. Who's that talking about? That's Jesus, okay. The lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has triumphed. He is able to open the scroll and its seven seals. Then I saw a lamb looking as if it had been slain, standing in the center of the throne, encircled by the four living creatures and the elders, he had seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent out into all the earth. And he came and took the scroll from where? Where's the scroll been at? From the right hand of him who sat on the throne. Who is that, you think, that's sitting on the throne? It's, it's God the Father sitting on the throne. And God the Father's got what in his right hand? And what's the problem? No one can open the scroll. Does that include God? God the Father. Right? He, he can't open the scroll either, right? If no one can open it, only, only who can open this scroll? Only Jesus. Now, is it a big deal to get this scroll open? Yes or no? Obviously so, right? If John's weeping because no one can open it, and then one of the elders says... The Lamb has overcome. Okay, if you keep on reading, it talks about He was slain. So the cross is what, is what empowers Jesus to be able to open this scroll. Now, let me ask you a question. I'll give you a little hint going to the question. You think it's best to take the book of Revelation, in most cases, you know, symbolically or literally? So let me ask you a question. Do you think God's sitting up there in heaven? He's got a scroll in his hand, and he's saying, I just can't get this thing open, you know? I mean, it's all bright, it's going to give me some trouble. And Jesus, come on in and open this up, right? I don't think that's really what, what, what the Bible is trying to communicate to us. Do you? It doesn't make sense, right? God's not really sitting up there with a scroll in his hand going, man, I wish somebody, you know, just, just, just had, the, had the hand strength to crack these seals open. Obviously not, right? It, it's a symbolic representation of, of deeper spiritual truths. So, let me ask you this question. We already answered. Where's the scroll found? It's in God's right hand. That's significant. If you do a study in the scriptures of God's right hand, there's a lot of passages that talk about God's right hand. I'm going to give you just a few to give you an idea of what this symbolizes. What does the right hand of God symbolize? Here's what we, what we see here. His right hand symbolizes... For example, Exodus 15, verse 6, God's power is his right hand. His law, it's Deuteronomy 33, 2. His goodness, Psalm 16, 11. His love, Psalm 17, 7. And his righteousness, Psalm 48, verse 10. That's just a, a, a small little sample. If we look really at, at, at when, the, when the Bible talks about the right hand of God, it's really talking about his character, his essence, who he is. Okay, His right hand. 
So, so this scroll concerns the character of God. Does that make sense? It, 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 there's something to do with this scroll that is a mystery. Its concealment causes this crisis. Has to do with the character of God. Only Jesus can resolve the crisis by opening the scroll and revealing its contents. Does that make sense so far? Okay. Well, let me explain what a scroll is, too. I mean, I think probably most of us know this. You know, a scroll is something we don't really see today, so let me just kind of break that down so we kind of have an image of what we're seeing here. So today, we don't have scrolls because we now have technology and you can bind books together and you can do it this way, okay? But they didn't have this in, in those days. If you wrote something down, you wrote it like on a piece of paper, like this, like Paul's writing his epistle, you know, like to the Corinthians, and he's writing it down, and then the way you sent it was you rolled it up, like this, and then you had some clay, and you took the clay, and you put a seal on it, like, you know, boop, and then it's sealed, and you can't open it unless you break the seal, so that way when you get it, you know it hasn't been tampered with, right, because the seal actually leaves residue. On it. So if somebody broke the seal trying to put a new one on, you would say, oh, somebody's put up some funny business. And so a king would actually would put a seal, and the king would have a signet ring, which was like, you know, the symbol of his authority, like, you know, putting this on here, boom, okay, this is from me. This is from the king. So you've got this scroll with these seven seals on it, and no one can open it except the lamb, except, except Jesus. And what you see when you get to Revelation chapter 6 is as he breaks each one of these seals, events happen on earth. So he breaks the first seal, boom, and then it describes events that happen on earth. Second seal, boom, and then some more events happen, and there's interpretation of those and so on. But I want us to get the big picture of it first, okay? The scroll. There's writing in the scroll, the front and on the back. So I'm sure you can get maybe an idea of what's in the scroll. You kind of look at it and get an idea, but you can't really open it up, you know, and see what's really in there. Now, question how many of you have ever wrote an email or a letter in your life? It's just, just written something to somebody else. This is going to be so simple, I'm almost embarrassed to ask this question. What's the purpose of writing something down for others? What are you trying to do? Communicate. It's just that simple. It's just a form of communication. So God wants to communicate. Does that make sense? He wants to communicate. Truths about his character. But he can't open the scroll, and nobody else can open the scroll. Now, the crisis is one over the character of God that only Jesus can resolve. Does that make sense? All right. So this controversy over the character of God. This is why God can't reveal. Because really, the whole issue of sin is really an attack on God's government and on God's goodness, okay? I wanted to keep preaching on that, but I'm going to get ahead of myself, and I want to get ahead of myself in the text here, okay? But that's what it's essentially all about. So, the central issue in the great controversy is can God be trusted? Is He trustworthy? Now, what if somebody that you have questions about their trustworthiness says... Don't worry, I'm trustworthy. Do you go, oh, he told me he's trustworthy, he's just resolved every issue. Of course you don't, right? Because when there's questions about someone's trustworthiness, the person's personal testimony of their trustworthiness doesn't have a lot of weight. Does that make sense? This is why if you're slandered or as people are saying bad things about you, it's kind of hard to vindicate yourself it's easier for other people to vindicate you who know you, who can be like character witnesses for you, okay? This is why God can't open the scroll himself, because it has to do with him and his character and his nature, and so this has to be communicated in a way other than he has the ability to communicate. So where did this great controversy get started? Why on earth would anybody start questioning God and the goodness of God? Now, I'm sure y'all studied this before, some of y'all. Who first had the idea of not trusting God and trying to put themselves on top? Lucifer, actually, yeah, his name became Satan later, Satan. In the Hebrew, Satan means uh, accuser, so somebody's a fault finder. So fault finding, accusing people 
what spirit is behind that? Uh, we should all be answering that very clearly, okay? Fault-finding, accusing people who always want to point out what is wrong with what people are doing and so on. What spirit is behind that? Jesus or Satan? That's Satan. Jesus did not go around putting his finger in everybody's chest. Okay, he told the truth and tell the truth as well, but it's just a different spirit, right? Jesus had a redemptive spirit that drew people to him. The Pharisees had a spirit that repulsed people from them, okay? Um, so you can see what, what kind of spirit was there in that. So yeah, it started there in, in, in heaven, okay? Isaiah chapter 14, once again, I'm just taking a real snippet from that whole, but that, that chapter is very fascinating. It really breaks down how sin got started and where it got started. It started with this angel in heaven named Lucifer, light bearer. Satan became his name later as he, as he changed. That's a common thing in scripture when somebody changes, either for good or bad, the name will often change with them. Okay, so he was once Lucifer. He was a light bearer. He was the highest uh, uh, non-divine authority in heaven and decided he would be in charge. And Isaiah 14 tells us what was going on inside of his mind. He said, I will ascend to heaven. I will set my throne on high. I will make myself like who? The most high. Who, who's the most high? Well, it ain't him, right? But he says, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be like the most high. That doesn't work out for him too well, though. But it sure creates a lot of problems. So that did not just stay in his mind. People's discontent rarely stays in their minds. It usually comes out where? Out of the mouth, right? If people are unhappy about something and they're brewing on something and they don't like, you know, how things are being done, it usually starts to come out of the mouth and it starts out in a very subtle way and just starts out and people start trying to draw people to their side, okay? And it creates a division. And this is what happened in heaven. Ezekiel chapter 28 unpacks this and talks about how Lucifer went stirring up this, this controversy in heaven. It says this, this is verse 16, by the abundance of your trading, and that Hebrew word trading, uh, Richard Davidson, who's an Adventist scholar at, at, the, at the seminary at Andrews, has done a lot of work on this, where he shows where this Hebrew word trading doesn't just mean like trading, like, you know, hey, I'll trade you a Mickey Mantle for a Babe Ruth, you know, like not that kind of trading. It's, a, it's really like trading of words and ideas and communication. So in other words, slander, okay? So speaking of Satan here, by the abundance of your slander, your trading, you became filled with violence within and you sinned. So he's going around sharing this discontent. And the more he talks about it, the, the, the more convinced he gets of this. And the more his rebellion in his own heart grows, and he's drawing other people in on it. And we see, I didn't put the text in here. You've heard me talk about this before, because this is so foundational in understanding these issues and understanding what the root of sin really is. Distrust of God. And um, so he goes down, if you look in Genesis chapter 3, he goes, or excuse me, I'm get rid of myself on that. We go to Revelation chapter 12. And it says that the dragon drew a third of the stars out of the sky and cast them down to the earth with him. In Revelation chapter 1, it says that stars are symbolic of angels. And so this, this divisiveness that he brought in heaven, he got a third of, of the angels to side with him on this. And um, it says there was warfare in heaven and, and, and they were cast out. So there was a... The first church split, in all seriousness, the first church split happened in heaven with Lucifer wanting to be in charge, wanting to be like God, going around, running his mouth about how things ought to be and why we should all be unhappy with God and his rules and his law. He's really bad and not good. And believe me, and this, that, and the other. And he got a third of, of them to go, and they started their own church. It's the church of the devil. And uh, it's become kind of popular here on earth. So we see that Revelation, excuse me, um, say this revelation. I'm going to Genesis chapter 3 here. This is how he gets it started. 
here on earth. He goes to our first parents. And he's saying, so did God say you can't eat of every tree, you know? Like God's restricting you. So he's planting these ideas. And notice the response. The woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden. But of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said... You shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it. Which actually he didn't say that. She put her words in his mouth. But that's another story, another sermon. Um, it's important to understand the Bible correctly. And not read things in that aren't there. Okay, that's, what, that's part of what got, got her out of sync. The serpents, where's the serpent at? He's in the tree. So he's probably touching it. So he can say, well, I'm touching it. I'm okay. So well, he, God never said touching it. Right? He said he did. So why did God tell them not to eat it? What was going to be the, the negative outcome if they were to eat it? Lest they what? Die. Okay, so it's a, don't do this for your own good. You choose evil, evil's going to come back and bite you hard. So just don't choose evil. Okay? And God gives us freedom. That's why the tree was there in the garden. It's a symbol of freedom. We can choose it if we want to. But God says, don't do it because that's going to be so destructive for you and I don't want that to happen to you, okay? Now, notice how the serpent reframes the issue. And the serpent said to the woman, you're not going to die. Don't believe God is lying. Here's what's really going on. For God knows that in the day you eat of it, you're going to be wise. You're going to have wisdom. You're going to know things. Your eyes are going to be opened. And you're going to be like who? Like the Most High. Who did he want to be like in Isaiah 14? I will be like the Most High. He said, follow me. Don't trust God. Follow me in this rebellion and you will be like God. So notice, God says, don't go down the path of evil. Because it's going to destroy you. Satan says, he says, don't go down this path because then you're going to be like him. And he doesn't want that. There's a real attack on the trustworthiness and the goodness of God. That's the philosophical underpinning of what's going on here. Do your own thing. Trust me, I'm telling you the truth. Rebel against God and you'll be better off. You can't trust what he says because he's restricting you to keep you down. He's restricting you for his own good and not for yours. When God had said, I'm giving you this restriction for your good. And so the central question in this great controversy between good and evil is this. Is God trustworthy? Can you really trust him? Okay. This is why God can't open the scroll. That's why you can't say, of course I'm trustworthy. Well, of course you're going to say you're trustworthy. Right? So, how does Christ demonstrate for us the goodness, or in other words, the trustworthiness of God? Okay? Well, I'll give you a lot of scriptures on this, but you just have to kind of fly over and just hit some highlights. How does God demonstrate his love for us? God demonstrates, all right? He doesn't just sit up there and say, I love you. He shows he loves us. How? He demonstrates his love for us in this. While we were undeserving, while we didn't give a rip, while we were just caught up in selfishness and doing what I want to do, and I could care less what my creator thinks, when that was the attitude of us, he did this. Jesus died for us. Paul goes on to say, you know, somebody might die for a really righteous person. You know? You hear these stories about, oh, you know, I'm going to give my kidney to, you know, somebody else. And I know there's a risk involved, but I, you know, was, you, know you hear these kind of stories. Somebody might do something like that. Other people usually lay down their life for that. But Paul says somebody might for a really good person lay down their life. But he says, nobody's going to lay down their life for a really bad person, right? But that's what Jesus has done for us. That while we were still sinners, Jesus died for you, for me, Trump, Obama, for Pelosi, for who else is bad? No, 
just joking. Bernie. <laughs> I'm just joking. Come on, let's not. Hillary. For, for the people in prison right now for doing horrible things. For the person who is unkind to you, disrespectful to her. But Jesus died for that person. Just like he died for you. Just like he died for me. And, and the Bible's saying that God is showing what he's like. That he is, and, and this wasn't like he died, like, oh, this was some rosy kind of thing. It was a bloody, ugly, hateful, brutal, painful, sick, evil thing that he went through, okay? And he did this out of love. No other motivation whatsoever. Out of love. And then it's saying that, this is showing us what God is like. Okay? Here's another one. Colossians 1 and verse 15. He, speaking of Jesus, is the image of the invisible God. So if we want to know what God is like, we can see what Jesus is like. Jesus actually said that. I want to say it's John chapter 13. And he says to his disciples, if you've seen me, You've seen the Father. They said, well, show us, what the, show us the Father. And he says, Philip, you, come on, man. You've been with me for a while now. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. So what is, what is the Father like? What is God like? You know, a philosopher once said, I read, he said, really, if you really take philosophy and just boil it down to its most foundational question, it really is this. Is there a God? And if so, what's God like? That's the most foundational question because the answer to that question takes you on a trajectory of different places. Okay? That's the fork in the road. Is there a God and what is he like? And Jesus says, you believe in God, believe also in me. Okay? He, he says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. So, so what is the nature of God? What is he like? Well, he's like this. When... Everybody's busy. He's busy. Everybody's worn out. Disciples are worn out. And these mothers want to bring their children to him. And they said, he don't have time to be putting a bunch of youngins in his lap. But no, he got some important stuff to do. Jesus says, no, no, guys. Bring these children on over here. And he puts little kids in his lap. And he prays for them and he blesses them and he smiles at them and he's kind to them. That's what God is like. What is God like? When there's a woman who has wrecked her life, Jewish girl, church girl, girl that grew up in the church, running around, doing things she shouldn't be doing, with a bunch of hypocritical religious leaders, it's a mess, right? This poor girl, her life's a mess. And they said, they bring her to Jesus, they said, this woman is caught in the very act of adultery. Jesus says that he of you that has not sinned, pick up a stone and be the first one to throw it. Then he starts writing the sand and he's writing the stuff they've done and they said, eh, I think it's about time to be heading on out of here. <laughs> and they all leave and then, and then, and then he says, where are, the, where are the people that were condemning you? And she says, well, they're not here, Lord. And he says, I don't condemn you either. Think about that. God says that to you. I don't condemn you. Satan, the accuser of the brethren, he does. But Jesus says, I don't condemn you. But he doesn't leave it at that. He actually said a few more words to the lady. What was it? Go and sin no more. So in other words, quit walking over to that tree and eating the fruit that I said don't eat. Okay? Because it gets you in situations like this. And it will ultimately get you in a situation that I can't get you out of if you don't let me. Right? That's tragic. That's why he says, stay away from that tree. The fruit may taste good for a moment, okay? But it's poison. And there's death in the fruit. So stay away from the tree. 
And he says it for whose good? For her good, for our good. So he says to the woman, go and sin no more. For whose good? For her good, right? So he says, I am not here to condemn you. I'm here to help you. I am your savior. So I don't condemn you. I'm not mad at you. I'm here to help you. But I need you to cooperate with me. So go and sin no more. Isn't God awesome? Well, that's what God is like, all right? That's what he's like. When he's getting nailed to a cross, and he says, Father, forgive them because they don't even know what they're doing. They're just mean and hateful and ignorant and dumb and don't even have a clue of what's happening here. But please forgive them for this, Lord. That's what God is like. I mean, just, just go through and read the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John, and see what Jesus is like. And that is what God is like. And that's the good news of the Gospel. That's the good news, that God is awesome, that He is wonderful, that He is loving, that He is our Savior, and that He will transform us and save us, and they both go together, okay? He will transform us and save us and make us like Him and take us to be with Him in heaven. If we just trust Him, in other words, exercise faith in Him, and demonstrate that faith by following Him. Okay? But here's the thing. This scroll that we're reading about, it's still closed, right? Because check this out. If you keep reading, you go to chapter 6, the sixth seal is describing the second coming of Jesus. Let that sink in for a minute. The scroll is still closed. The cross made Jesus worthy to open the scroll, but the scroll hadn't been cracked open and, 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 and opened up yet, okay? Because the sixth seal is describing the second coming of Jesus. And then here's what happens after Jesus comes. <clears throat> and we see the seventh seal opened, or broken. When the seventh seal is broken, the scroll is open. The mystery of God is fulfilled. It says in Revelation. Is that 10? I had that verse in here, but I thought I was getting too many texts going. But it actually says, remember these things are parallel, right? The, the, the trumpets, the seals, the churches, all that. So when it talks about, it says in, in Revelation, I want to say 10. It says that when, when the seventh angel blows his trumpet, which is synonymous with the seventh seal. Okay, they go together. When the seventh angel blows his trumpet, the mystery of God is complete. The scroll is opened. Okay? His character is revealed. And then it tells us what, in another passage, what's happening when the seventh angel blows his trumpet is when the kingdom is really finally delivered to Christ and to his saints. So it's the end of the millennium. It's the end of when, when sin is finally done away with. The, the rebellion is over. Okay? And we'll unpack that more later on, so keep coming each week. All right? but, but, but the universe is really, this whole controversy, this whole issue, this whole terror in, in, the, in the relationships of, of, of the creatures of God when it's over and there's healing in the universe, the mystery of God is it's fulfilled. And people know what God is like. And there's no more, like Paul says, we see through a glass darkly, but then we'll see face to face. That's the seeing face to face time. We see what God is like. We see his character. It's absolutely beautiful. It's loving. That's why sin's not going to happen a second time. Because... Not because God changes, rewires our heads so we can't do it. We'll always have freedom because freedom and love go together. Sin will happen a second time because everyone there has seen the beauty of the loving character of God and, and has been changed and managed to. Okay? So when that seventh seal is broken and that scroll, which is just, it's all symbolic. There's no real, there's no real scroll in nobody's hand. But it's symbolic. When that seventh seal is broken... The mystery of God, the beauty of God, the controversy is solved. He's loving, he's beautiful, he's kind, he's amazing. And all that is revealed. 
What's the response of heaven? Revelation 8, verse 1. When he opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about half an hour. Just... Just like reverential awe of God. Just amazing. Like David said in the Psalms, he said, Oh, that I, that I may go into God's sanctuary, that I may behold the beauty of the Lord. So one day the universe will see God for who He is. It's going to be beautiful. Do you want to see God in this light, in this way. Because we get a glimpse of it now. If, if, you're, if you're here and, and, and you've, let, you've let Jesus in, that's conversion. It does something on the inside that is incredibly powerful, that changes our hearts, change our nature, and the love of God is manifested inside of us. Anybody ever gone through that? I hope you have, because that's conversion. <laughs> it, it, it's a powerful experience that is absolutely revolutionary in the life and life changing. Okay, and if that hasn't happened to you, maybe maybe you're not religious at all. Maybe you are religious, but that's never happened. That's is what matters. You know, I didn't get into this because this is going on forever. But but Paul talks also about the mystery being Christ in us. Okay, the hope of glory. We experience that by exercising faith, letting Christ in, and, and He'll do His job. Just seek Him with all your heart. He will do His job. He will convert us. And then Paul says that's actually like, like a, it's like a taste of what is to come. So, so when, we, when we catch those glimpses in our lives, does it, it is not an everyday thing, but there's times when we just catch the glimpse of the wonderfulness and the beauty of God. That's just a deposit on the treasure that God has in store for us. One day, the whole universe, you and I included, if we just trust Jesus to follow Him, will see God for who He is, and it will be absolutely beautiful. And the last... Lines on the book, The Great Controversy. Anybody read the book, The Great Controversy? That's a, that's a really important book. If you want a copy of it, ask me. I will give you one, okay? I got them like right over there. So I can get it for you in like 10 seconds. All right? If you haven't read it in a while, read it again. It's a great book. It'll unpack. I'm just giving you a little bit of what you'll get out of that book, okay? It'll unpack it. It's powerful. But the last few lines of that book that describe what I'm talking about here today, of this controversy being ended, this harmony in the universe, this beauty of the character of Jesus and of God, it says this. The great controversy has ended. Sin and sinners are no more. The entire universe is clean. One pulse of harmony and gladness beats through the vast creation. <clears throat> From Him who created all flow life and light and gladness throughout the realms of illimitable space. From the minutest atom to the greatest world, all things, animate and inanimate, in their unshadowed beauty and perfect joy, declare, that God is love. God is love. 1 John 4. God is love. He loves you. Wouldn't it be a nice thing to love Him back? Wouldn't that be the cool thing to do? Wouldn't it be seriously uncool to not respond to a God like this with love and response? It's not being a good guy. It's not being a good gal to do that, right? For a God who loves us enough to do all this that he's done for us, and we didn't deserve it, we should love him too, shouldn't we? And if we love him, we should keep his commandments.
And he says, for this is the love of God, that we keep His commandments, and His commandments are not burdensome. Staying away from that stupid tree is not burdensome, guys. If we think it is, it's because our minds aren't clear. Right? And they're not. Mine too. <laughs> That's why we have to trust in Him and follow His word, because it says the, it says the fruit looked good to the woman, looked fine to her, made sense to her. So she took of it and ate it. Well, stuff will make sense to us that just ain't good. So it's imperative to trust. That may make sense to me, but God says it's not good, so I'm going to trust Him more than me, and I'm going to do what He says, because He is love. Amen? Amen? That's the bottom line, and that's what it's all about. So let's do it. Amen, church? Amen. Praise the Lord. And let's tell other people about this, too. Amen. That's all He calls us to do. Believe it, follow it, and tell other folk about it. I'll do it. How about you? Amen? Amen. Father in heaven, thank you so much for just being who you are, Lord. What can we say? What can we say, Lord? Help us, Lord, to see through that darkened glass just a little more clearly, I pray, that we could just see how good you are and that you would help us become like that because that's the best way for us to communicate it. I mean, we can talk about it. And that's good, and we need to talk about it. But Lord, what it's happening on the inside and, and bleeding out on the outside, that right there, Lord, is what shows the world who you are. And so, Lord, help us just turn away from sin and unbelief and backsliding, and let's be real, Lord. Oh, God, help us and save us from ourselves. Help us to get up in the morning and come to church, to read the word, to pray and believe, and to follow what you say and watch you do the amazing work that you will do. In Jesus' name we pray and give thanks. Amen. Amen. If you want a great controversy, if you want to get baptized, if you want, follow God. Talk to me up there, okay? God bless y'all. Happy Sabbath.